I'm Barbara Nichols, and tonight I'm substituting for Cindy. Not that anyone could really do that, but she has worked very hard this year. But she saw from San Antonio welcoming her granddaughter to the world. So we're fortunate that the friends of Mimi have worked and they bring you this special evening. They, along with many others, make tonight possible. And first, I want to single out our underwriters who are listed here on the screen and also in your programs. We couldn't host an event like this without their strong support. So join me in thanking them. And now we come to what I usually do, the Art Trust Report. And that part of it's going to be very brief because I want to tell you a story instead. But we are proud to tell you that all the programs that we ask you to support in the Preserve the Vision campaign are all complete or are continuing. The paintings have been conserved and photographed and now all of them are under UV plexiglass. Our archivist, Nicole Danforth, has made major progress devising our system and initiation, initiating the project. But now I want to tell you about Charles. This portrait by Marcella Combs was purchased by the students in 1948 and I know that we have people here in the audience who were students at that time. And so we thank you for Charles. Mr. Beatty, who was one of the two teachers who founded this collection in 1936, told us that the artist had a local tie because her father was an, it's hard to say it, ecclesiastical architect, and he designed Holy Family Church in you know, Trove. And then the portrait itself has always been a favorite with the students. However, today we have an advantage that Mr. Beatty didn't have. We have the internet. And in researching this artist, we found a number of interesting facts. Marcella Combs Winslow, her married name, was one of the most noted mid-20th century portrait artists. Her works hang in national and international museums. She lived in Pittsburgh, studied at Carnegie Tech, but moved to Washington, D.C. just before World War II. Her husband was in the armed services, but died at the very end of the war. She remained in Washington, where she painted the portraits of a number of famous people. People like Robert Frost, Ezra Pound, Robert Lowell, and Eudora Welty. And how do we know this? Well, the internet research led us to a volume of her letters that were published from 1943 to 1959. They were letters to her mother-in-law. And in this book, we found our Charles. He worked for Marcella Combs as a handyman. And I'd like to quote from a letter from the artist to her mother-in-law dated December 31st, 1947. She said, December has required additional services from Charles, one being portrait sitting. He has such fine features added to that benign expression. And I wanted to get his hands in with those extra long fingers. And she said later she wanted them because those hands emphasized the point that this was the dignity of those who work with their hands. She, so she made a three-quarter life-size portrait. And she said, it's one of my very best. His expression is just right. And then later in a letter in the spring of 1948, she again 
wrote that since her mother-in-law was so interested in the negotiations, remember that word, that went on over the sale of my portrait of Charles, it had been selected from a Pittsburgh area show to be included in a group being considered by the Latrobe High School in Pennsylvania for their permanent collection. Now I know that a lot of you have heard about Mr. Beatty's negotiations with the artists. And I hear some laughter, yes. Now you can hear about this one from the artist's point of view. And she wrote, I received a phone call from the school offering me a price for the painting that was only half the price put on it. That's Mr. Beatty. <laughs> And she said, I felt I could not accept the offer, although I regretted turning down any sum from these young students who had voted in their favor for their art collection. And then while she was feeling guilty, the school called again. And she says that he said they had gone over the books and could raise the amount a bit. He added, that the kids raised all the money for their purchases for the collection by selling hot dogs. <laughs> and finally, she added, their get up and go succeeded where money had failed. And so Charles came to La Trobe. The student council at that time wrote a letter to Charles telling him how much they appreciated this portrait. And they added, your picture says you're a delightful old gentleman. Well, Marcella Combs wrote that Charles carried that note in his pocket, and it was there the day he died. It's a wonderful story, and we have all of you to thank for it. Your support and your contributions have ensured that Charles today looks just as he did when he left the artist's easel. And in addition, your support means that all the research and stories and documents related to this collection will be preserved for the use of students and scholars in the future. And so on behalf of them, we thank you. And to the recognition of our special honorees this evening. And to do that, we have James R. Okanak, the Executive Director and Secretary of the McFeely Rogers Foundation. Well, we're fortunate to have Barbara Nagels as Chair of the Art Trust. A little bit. Uh, I think Dr. Baroli is in the audience. Um, she was here um, 46 years ago, 1967, the first year of this high school. She said to me, uh, Jim, I think it might be a good idea if you did your senior speech on this stage. I was petrified. I'm back. <laughs> I'm still a little nervous. It's my pleasure and privilege on behalf of the Art Conservation Trust to honor one of our trust valued partners, the Latrobe Art Center. Within our great Latrobe School District catchment area, there is a special place that brings together creative arts from throughout the region, where risk-taking, vision, appreciation, exploration, spirit, kindness, adventure, enthusiasm, possibilities, and talent collide. And you can be charmed at times with a scrumptious smoothie, great cup of coffee, and a delicious lunch. It was the vision of Libby Hazlett and, La and Lainey Crozier, the dreams of local artists that ignited the hub within our downtown that has become the place to be. With a dedicated board, critical financial support from devoted members in, of the community, and devoted members of the art Center, leadership and from an exceptional young lady, 
who along with a tireless, multitasking staff, they have not only set the art world on fire, they have led, they have led the revitalization program in downtown Latrobe. 11 years young, the Art Conservation Trust truly values our Art Center friends and the endless opportunities in the creative art it brings to all of us in the Latrobe community. I want to present to you the president of the Art Center, Dr. Georgia Tepper, and Gabrielle Nesta. gratitude, the Gray Latrobe Art Conservation Trust, and the students of the Gray Latrobe School District honor the Latrobe Art Center for its part in bringing the creative arts to downtown Latrobe and to the wider region. We honor especially the remarkable vision of Nancy Rogers Crozier and Elizabeth Ogden Hazlett, who in 2002 determined to create a site where artists, art lovers, and art discoverers might gather. The Latrobe Art Center is the result of that vision. The mission statement of the Latrobe Art Center states it is to be a community hub to foster creativity, encourage, explore, present an appetite for art in all its forms. Under the leadership of an enterprising board of directors along with Gabrielle Nastek, the inspired director of the center, the Latrobe Art Center has become the creative heart of the Great Latrobe community. Whether it be the center's classes, shows, celebrations, or the Fred Rogers Jury Exhibition, the students of our school district and the members of our community will continue to benefit from the efforts and vision of those who created and those who continue to bring the inspiration of the creative arts to the Latrobe Arts Center. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Jim. Um, Jim has said it all, but on behalf of the Latrobe Art Center Board of Directors, as well as the employees who are here this evening, we are honored to receive this recognition, and we greatly thank you. Most of all, I would like to thank the lady that is sitting beside me right here, Gabrielle Nastuck. And if you heard what Jim said, occurs in the Art Center, and if you have not had the opportunity to experience that, you must stop by the Art Center. When you see Gabrielle interact with the children that come to the Art Center for classes, as well as the way she teaches professional artists as well, you will just be awed. So if you have not had that opportunity, please take the time to come visit the Art Center. I would also like to thank Mrs. Barbara Naples and the Art Conservation Trust as well. But most of all, again, I would like to introduce you to our director of the Latro Art Center, Gabrielle Nasta. Know, but then when they walk into the center, it is their neighborhood art center. 
It is their time to shine, and it is their time to be and express themselves freely. We are so blessed to have Latrobe Elementary School in walking distance of the Latrobe Art Center. We have formed a strong bond with the children over the years, that I feel all of the kids are our kids. We get the opportunity to teach them from a young age how important art is in life. We work with children who cannot write their name. Some cannot talk and some can identify colors, but put a paintbrush in their hand and watch them create a masterpiece. This is art. This is something that they need in their lives, their release, their way of communicating to the world. And it's very rewarding that the Late Trove Art Center can be that place where they do not have to worry about what is right or what is wrong. All they have to do is be themselves. <laughs> the greatest attribute that the Late Trove Art Center has is multitasking. A typical day at the Art Center can start with an adult watercolor class going on in one half of the gallery, with a lunch rush in the other half, the Late Trove Elementary Schools in the Annex doing an art project, customers coming in, the phone ringing, and me standing in the middle of all the madness and chaos, just smiling of everything that is going on. Smiling because it is such a good feeling to know that we, the Late Trove Art Center, is the place to be. We are the driving force that keeps La Trove alive, and you can feel the energy immediately when you walk in. And all of that would not be possible if the Late Trove Art Center was not made up of such a dedicated staff and volunteers. Over the past three and a half years, we have, not, we have become not only a team, but a family. No one is perfect, and we all make mistakes. But we learn from those mistakes, and we learn from each other. We are all one, and we are all there to help each other succeed. And this is why the Late Trove Art Center is successful. Because everyone comes together, works together, and is passionate about what they do. And most importantly, they love what they do. With that said, it is my privilege to introduce to you those who live and work within the special neighborhood that is the Late Trove Art Center. So would you please stand? Joseph Bellack, Sam. Panda, <laughs> Jenny Hutchinson, Lauren Condon, Seth Rupert, Maria Graziano, Melinda Smigma, Emily Latimer, Joseph O'Toole, Marty Singer, Lee Murkowski, Kathy Rafferty, and my mentors through all of this, Mrs. Dinah Crowling and Mr. Jim Oknack. If you are an artist, please stand. If you are a member, a volunteer, or donor of the Late Trove Art Center, please stand. Thank you for supporting us, for loving us, and making us feel extra special.
Hello, we are Max Mears and Keely Thomas, sixth grade students from Mountain View Elementary School. Friendly Tigers is the title of the photograph that has joined the permanent collection at our school. Friendly Tigers was created by a Pittsburgh-based photographer named Travis Smeltzer. The first thing Mr. Smeltzer purchased after getting his first job was a 35mm Canon film camera. Although he has acquired more sophisticated cameras over the years, he never lost his love of capturing moments in time or beautiful sights through photography. This particular shot was printed on a sheet of metal using a complicated and expensive process called dye sublimation. During this process, the ink is heated and turns to a gas which penetrates the pores of the metal. When I first saw this photograph in person, I loved how shiny and unique it was. I believed this helped it stand out among other artworks and seem like the natural choice for our collection. Mr. Smelter was raised on a farm, which allowed him to view animals at play, as well as the beautiful landscapes around him. He began to appreciate seeing anim animals interact and roam free. Perhaps this helped him patiently wait for the right view while I watched these two strong and captivating tigers at the zoo. Mr. Smeltzer says that capturing moments in time and bringing beauty into people's homes, workplaces, and now schools make his job worthwhile. Part of his mission statement says, the world needs to take the time to enjoy this beauty given the complexity of life today. I enjoy how Mr. Smeltzer took the time to manipulate the photograph using a computer program. I feel this made the photo more vivid and exciting for the students and adults who will be watched over by the friendly tigers every day in the halls of Mountain View Elementary School. Thank you. And now the students from Bagley Elementary School. This year is an acrylic painting done on a tree mushroom by well-known local artist Kathy Satoris Rafferty. The sculptural piece is entitled The Dawn. Mrs. Rafferty has two daughters and is a lifelong resident of Lake Trobe, where she lives with her husband of 41 years. Previously, she worked as a secretary at our own local kettle metal plant for 12 years. She claims no formal training in art, but expresses a love for doing anything creative. Her interests include painting, interior decorating, flower arranging, entertaining family and friends, and playing the piano. She attributes her love of the arts to her father who loved to draw. Inspiration for many of her paintings come from everyday things around her. She says, realism is my style of art and painting, and some things just speak to you. As a child, I loved looking at Norman Rockwell's paintings. He seemed to have a love for everyday simple life things around him. I personally enjoyed this piece because she took nature and combined it with her artistic talent. This work of art was created on a piece of tree mushroom discovered in the woods by her brother, a local art framer. The choice of the subject matter for the dawning happened by chance one day as she was looking out a window and observing several deer eating apples in her neighbor's yard. The painting is a soft morning scene of dawn breaking out to usher in a new day. The font of the foreground depicts the beginning of a new life. The mounting of the painting on, the, on a large rock gives it a sculptural feel and is quite unusual, but a perfect completion to this nature-inspired artwork. The shade of green in the painting appeals to me because it reminds me of the cool quiet in the woods. Our next do docents are from Latro Elementary School. to our permanent art collection entitled Sunrise Over Pittsburgh by Travis Smeltzer. Mr. Smeltzer has enjoyed photography even growing up as a small child. Early on, he was struck by the idea that a photographer can capture just one moment for an entire lifetime. Over the years, he has improved on his skills and has been able to purchase new cameras and lenses. In this photograph, Mr. Smeltzer captures a beautiful sunrise over the Pittsburgh skyline. He said, I wanted the photo to show the sun as it arose over top of the buildings. What is interesting about photography is you can plan, but you never know what you will or won't see. 
Various photography, Mr. Smeltzer appreciates the various architecture in Pittsburgh. He said that he often drives an hour into the city in hopes of seeing something great. Using different shutter speeds and merging them together, the artist allows us to get the full effect of the colors. He uses a Canon brand camera which includes special lenses that allow him to zoom in twice as close. As we see here, he captures an amazing sunrise, one that is very rich in color. The sun illuminates the top of the buildings. We are proud to add this to our art collection at LES. Thank you. Our next presenter is from the junior high school. My name is Lauren Singett, and I'm a seventh grader at Latrobe Junior High School. One of the pieces the junior high purchased last year is titled Carolina Morning by Richard McWhorter. Mr. McWhorter's day job consists as an art instructor and department chair at Dairy Area High School. For about 40 years, Mr. McWhorter has primarily used photography as a tool for creative expression to document landscapes. For the past three or four years, he has combined his passion for photography and digital painting into one, with embellishing his photographs using virtual paint. Carolina Morning is part of a series of tactical dreamscape photographs that blurs the lines between photography, drawing, and painting. These expressionistic images often evoke curiosity as to which parts of the image are real and which are painted on with imagination giving the photographs a dreamlike quality. For this particular artwork, the original photograph was taken in South Carolina during a late morning visit to a protected swamp sanctuary. Later, the <coughs> photograph was painted on with an electric stylus and computer. There are multiple layers and different techniques added to create the textures as seen on this piece. The focal points are the trees and their reflections in the water. The repetition of the vertical tree lines and earthy greens and browns create balance and harmony. This outdoor scene containing blurred images and objects is reminiscent of painters like Monet and Van Gogh, artists which Mr. McWhorter are influenced by. On a last note, Mr. McWhorter stated, I want to say thank you for your hard work and dedication to the art program, and especially taking time to notice the creative efforts of our regional artists. I am very grateful to be included in such a prestigious collection. The students of the junior high thank you, Mr. McWhorter, for creating a visually interesting painted photograph for our collection. The next Dawson is Kara Bethke, who will be presenting the second artwork purchased from the junior high art collection. I see much more. 
Mr. Jundrix, who received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Juniata College, has been influenced by many people throughout his life, such as his aunt Vera and his high school teacher. Many artists have also had an influence on him, such as Van Gogh, Monet, Pissarro, and others. Hints of these artist impressionistic styles can be seen in the overwhelming blues of this piece. Music and religion also have an impact on his painting. Gendrix believes that there is music in painting and painting in music, hence the title of his piece, Harmony of Nature. The artist points out that the viewer can see a cross and a star of David in the center of the painting. From afar, the painting is predominantly blue. However, up close, the viewer can see small dots of every color in intricate rainbow grid work, making the painting appear quilt-like. Mr. Gendrix offers these words of advice to the viewer. Keep your personal view healthy and draw from what is obvious in my painting and not so obvious. Pursue that which you know and are curious and comfortable with. Mara Kohler Keeney shares that her paintings are about dramatic moments in the life of plants and natural subjects. Abounding exuberance, a realistic oil painting of a hibiscus flower, is certainly dramatic, both in size and in the contrast between light and shadow. The artist also explains that she captures the flower as it builds up to key moments in its life. Cool bloom which lasts only about one day. The texture and movement of the opening petals draws the viewer's eye in, revealing the center of the flower. Keeney now teaches at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, where she earned her Bachelor of Science in Art Education and her Master of Arts in Drawing and Painting. She likens noticing the intricacies of the hibiscus to discovering the essence of ourselves. Her use of depth creates a flower that leaps from the canvas, but also pulls the viewer in. With even a mere glimpse of this piece, I am overcome with a sense of exuberance. My <coughs> next dosing is Taylor Delancey. This piece, created by Zan Mayer, is an oil painting titled Night of the Pond. Mayer is inspired by what he describes as the darker side of nature, and his purpose of this particular piece is to show that nature isn't always beautiful. The work depicts a somber body of water through fragments of trees in the foreground. From the dark hues, the viewer recognizes that this is portrayed at night to bring attention to the gloomy allure of nature. By placing fragments of trees in the foreground, the viewer is instilled with a feeling of something ominous, you feel as if you're a child hiding in the night and straining behind an obstacle to see what is in front of you. When paired with the dark hues of the rest of the work, I envision the artist looking at a memento of his childhood and remembering what it is like to see through the eyes of innocence again, where everything is still glorious and new. However, the overall darkness of this piece suggests he's struggling to find the wonder of his childhood and he cannot see the way he did years ago. This anguish, frustration, and inadequacy we endure as we grow has clouded his childhood vision, and now all he sees is the darker side of nature. This piece by Stephen Hankin shows an elderly woman playing a cello in front of a modern boutique. This real, realistically constructed image is painted loosely for the artist to portray his respect for art and show a modern twist on the classical impressionistic style of painting. This artist claims to not have one specific inspiration for this piece, which appears to represent a conflict between contemporary and classical styles of art. The older woman is probably symbolic of a previous generation's artistic style and is being cropped off the canvas to emphasize the struggle between the two generations. Also by placing the elderly woman in the foreground, the viewer's eye immediately travels from her to the brighter, more modern style and elevation of a mannequin into the background to show the youthful, vibrant superiority 
of the older woman's generation of thinking. Hankin's choice of a straightforward title instead of an emotional title may have been to help the viewer to develop their own interpretation of the work and to discern what is happening in a literal way in the painting. Our next docent will be Nick Aiello. First Presbyterian Church 2 by William M. Hoffman, Jr is an oil painting of the iconic Lake Trevor Church. This painting is the second time the church has been the main focus of the work. The contrast between the dark colored building and the clear blue sky helps to bring the building distinctly into focus among the rich colors and textures of this cityscape. Hoffman graduated from Lake Trevor High School in 1951 and considers our town an important inspiration for his art. Mr. Hoffman earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Pennsylvania and a Master of Fine Arts from Temple University. He also taught art at Rutgers University for 33 years. The artist hopes his painting will preserve the images of important landmarks in nature. This painting would be a good candidate for a collection because it captures something so close to our community. Greenwich Street, Natrona, PA, depicts a street about an hour from here in the artist's hometown. While growing up in Natrona, Mark E. Wileski felt that he took the streets for granted. So, he wanted to honor them visually in this world. Mr. Wileski is now retired from Elizabethtown Area School District, where he taught art for 38 years. His tool of choice, he says, is a brush, not a camera. Even though he paints realistic subject matter, which is done with acrylics this time, he tries not to paint too photographic. The mill in the background of the painting actually was taken down not long after the painting was completed. Like La Trobe, Latrona has seen many changes. I think this painting helps to capture similarities between the two towns, making it a great candidate for a collection. The next dose is Abby Gunderson. <laughs> Lincoln Hack composed this realistic piece, People of New Guinea, Leafman. After completing her undergraduate degree at Penn State University, she obtained a master's in art education at Kutztown University. Mrs. Mack is now a teacher here at Greater Lake Trove Senior High School, where she continues to influence and inspire her art students. To create this piece, Mrs. Mack first used white charcoal on gray gesso covered canvas. <coughs> to draw the image of a photograph taken by her husband in Papua New Guinea. Then, she applied an underpainting to the darkest areas of the drawing, filling it in with lights, mediums, and darks before finally adding in the fine details. The oils create striking colors that easily capture rich earth tones. The subject of the painting is a group of Papua New Guinea nationals wearing traditional tribal costumes for a sing sing. In this celebration, groups of men, women, and often children dress in traditional costumes, paint their faces and bodies, and compete for status and awards by singing and dancing. The artist, when asked about the purpose of this work, said, it's important for people to learn about other cultures through art and to see how other cultures incorporate art into their lives. Creek is a monochromatic oil painting by Thomas Levy, who has a long history working with art. He worked as an illustrator and photographer at Gateway Studio for 15 years and Aubrey Lee and Associates for 17 years. Le Letty is currently retired and now seeks to find pleasure in his work. When asked about his work and style, the artist says, it is what it is and I paint the way I paint. As I first encountered Creek, 
I got lost in a heartwarming childhood memory of my best friend and I playfully skipping from rock to rock in the creek below her house. This piece would make an extraordinary contribution to the collection in the school. Though we are sophomores, juniors, and seniors, we still need a break from SATs, <coughs> graduation projects, and keystone exams to travel back in time and once again play tag with friends in the park. Our next docent will be Jocelyn Kimball. I really couldn't see a dog. 
All I saw were a bunch of lines. But after taking a step back and looking at it more carefully, I could finally see the dog porter going mad. <laughs> the artist uses the dog as his subject to reveal one of his greatest frustrations. Porter, a husky shepherd mix, was raised at Father Kecker's old monastery which had 500 acres of land, so the dog was never leash trained. When Father Kecker had to move to his new position at the convent, he found an impossible walk porter who now had to be on a leash. Porter would dart, run, and roam, and not come back for hours. Porter would also bite people out of play and frustration. The title, How I Love My Little Porter, is ironic. Father Kecker loves the dog, but admits Porter drives him crazy. The use of bright colors and the wild representation of the dog makes this piece an entertaining and creative view of dogs as crazy, lovable creatures. Our next docent is Matthew Proch. A visit to the Lake Trip Speedway in 1963 sparked Ken Berget's interest in art. In junior high at the time, Mr. Margaret would later attend the Dayton Art Institute for two years and the Cincinnati Art Academy for one year. After abandoning his commercial printing business, the artist cared for his mother, who was always supportive of his pursuits in art. Four tunes arose in the midst of a dream, and what we see today materialized through his process of transferring his vision onto the canvas. Margaret, who is particularly influenced by Salvador Dali and Sal Scarpetta, believes that all artists are intertwined on a connected path and that all art is influenced by artwork before it. The title, Fortune, is the word fortune separated into two parts, much like the foreground and the background of the painting and the artist's creative process, envisioning and translating. Bergen says that the interpretation of this piece may vary depending on, upon the viewer. To me, the leaves appear as shadowy in the dark background, emphasizing the underlying role of nature in our lives. The bright bubblegum pink lines that divide the artwork represent the strength and the happiness that come with success. The red paint splattered uniformly around the painting harmonizes the importance of nature and success. While Ken Berger typically looks to nature as his inspiration when creating a new piece, he cites another painting by influential focus painter Henry Matisse as the inspiration for this work. Dance Roll alludes to Matisse's 1909 work, which was simply titled Dance. Berger traced the outstretched, intertwined arms of the dancers in Matisse's artwork to form the inner shape featured in a bright shade of chartreuse. Margaret's inspiration of nature is also apparent in this piece, as the only obvious shapes are those of the leaves. He relies on contrast to draw the viewer to the focal point of the artwork, the shape Matisse initially created in dance that symbolizes unity. Margaret's creative process begins when he envisions a sketch in a dream, and he brainstorms to find the best way to represent this sketch in reality. His medium is enamel on canvas, as it allows him to quickly transfer his vision into artwork. Our next docent is Emily Porter. Floral Hill Creek is an oil painting by Calvin Lynch, influenced by multiple workshops, books, and personal experiences. Lynch is an accredited artist with experience as an art director, illustrator, and graphic designer. He also owns a personal art studio. Mr. Lynch graduated from the Philadelphia Museum College of Art with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Painting, Design, and Illustration. After college, he began teaching painting and figure drawing at the Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh. Laurel Hill Creek depicts late autumn shadows along the ground, which lend elegance to the piece and emphasize the subdued light of the season. The creek itself is surrounded by trees and other vegetation, ranging in color and value, adding depth and realism. Currently residing in the mountains above Confluence, 
Lynch displays his adoration for nature through his painting. His style is impressionistic and is reflected in the simulation of the scene, the soft lines, and colors. Together with the artist's attention to detail, these elements give Laurel Hill Creek a dreamlike appeal, allowing his audience to create a personal interpretation of the landscape. A recently retired professor at Seton Hill University, Stuart Thompson, earned a Bachelor of Science in Art Education from Edinburgh before attending Penn State University and earning both a Master's Degree and PhD in Art Education. Spruce Run Trail is an oil painting of a photograph that Thompson took while skiing on Laurel Mountain. Thompson, who loves the outdoors, attempts to portray the pristine view of the untouched snow around the trail. He does so through his bright color choice for this virgin snow, contrasted by the dark trees and the shadows of the painting. However, the blue blaze appearing to the left of the landscape serves as a reminder to the audience that we're not really in total wilderness. The rigid, straight lines and absence of movement in the painting evoke a sense of a warring serenity unique to the winter season. Thompson, who prefers to utilize his own experiences for inspiration, uses his own photograph as the model for Spruce Run Trail, thus adding a personal touch to the piece as well as preserving his original vision. Our next docent is Marissa Miller. Although Diane White holds a Bachelor of Science in Nursing, she finds a way to express herself through her creations. Grand Feast is one of them. Grand Feast is a unique oil painting that combines a traditional style with a modern concept. In other words, Miss White begins with a still life and adds the modern taste of Chinese takeout to exhibit her ideal work of art. Looking at the painting, you can see that the flow of the cloth combined with the accurate shadowing brings focus to the Chinese platter. Red, a sacred Chinese color, is used not only for the dish, but also for the neighboring containers and their designs. When asked what her inspiration was for creating this piece, White responded that she didn't necessarily have an outline, just an idea. It could have been created by a picture she had seen in an antique shop, or it could have been a coffee cup of coffee that she had brought back from a cafe. When she names the artwork she makes, the name comes to her either before, during, or after it is complete. What called out to me in this painting was the fact that it's fluid and full of life. The artist portrayed the detail of each object vividly, and perhaps now we can find the true beauty of it in such a simple concept. Our final docent is Samantha Friedline. Thoughts were like stepping into the artist's mind. 
The twisted lines and ladders gave me a sense of general confusion and abandonment. Overall, I think the piece is posing a question rather than making a statement. Can I get over my past so I can fo focus on my future? When asked about the meaning behind her piece, Volume Mute, Shelley Berry replied, To me, a work might be considered successful when the viewer is able to construct a meaning for themselves. After sharing my interpretation, I challenge you to interpret this piece through your own eyes. This concludes the art presentation.
saxophone, Laura Lejeune on tenor saxophone, Dylan Powell on trombone, Maddie Bucci on trumpet, Hannah Pritchard on trumpet, Carter Sheen on piano, Chris Nagels on drums. Who am I forgetting? <laughs> Lindsay Ferguson, vocal solo, thank you.
by Stuart Thompson. And also tied for fifth place, Volume Mute by Shelley Barry. Your fourth place is Snowed In by Doreen Kerr. And your third place, Night at the Pond by Sam Mayer. Your second choice was First Presbyterian Church to William Hoffman. And here's what you voted for first. Uh, what is it? Abundant, abounding exuberance by Mara Kohler Caney. In fifth place, Night at the Pond by Sam Mayer. In fourth place, First Presbyterian Church II by William Hoffman. Your third place is Volume Mute by Shelley Barron. Second place, Where Buffalo Roam by Peter West. People of New Guinea, please men, by our own liberty. So again, we want to thank all of you for your continued support for the art collection and for all of our art conservation trust projects. We, in appreciation, have a gift for each of you you may pick up a new set of note cards as you go out in the auditorium lobby. We want to thank also all the volunteers that made this event possible. And there are so many of them, I ask you to look at your program to see their names. And now we're in a few minutes, we are inviting you to return to the Center for Student Creativity for more coffee and cookies. And in addition, we ask that all of our artists tonight join us there. Perhaps you could stand by your, your paintings. We will have a photographer to take your pictures and let the people meet you and discuss your works. And please note also that all of the works that are not purchased by the students are available for sale. If you'll see Mrs. Golden, if you're interested. And we also have catalogs of the collection available for sale in the Center for Student Creativity. And Ron McKenzie will be glad to help you. We're going to conclude this part of the evening with Greater Latrobe's alma mater. So thank you. Good night. We hope to see you again next year.